I hope that by the time we're done today, that you'll have a greater appreciation for the spoken word. Because a lot of you know this first, life and death. Yeah, it says death and life in the power of the tongue. So our words are important. I'm not going to go to James for, for much today, but you can read the first chapter of James, the third chapter of James. He talks about how powerful this is and how hard it is for us to tame it, right? Anybody can relate? Some things leak out out of your mouth sometimes, and after it's said, you can't reel it back in, can you? So we should be repenting often, I think, for some of the things we say. Um, last week, uh, I spoke about we were once darkness, and now we are light in the Lord. And then the last part of it says, aim higher. And this is connected to that, the idea of aiming higher uh, with our spoken words. Okay, because we, we do a lot of communication verbally, but we also do a lot of communication non-verbally. You all know that, right? Anybody who's had any training in psychology, you know that's even a majority of the, of the communication is nonverbal. It's the look in our eyes. It's if we're looking at our watch or not, if we're in a hurry, if, we look, if we're rolling our eyes. It's usually not a good sign to the other person. <laughs> so what does God think? He thinks you're here for a reason, I'm here for a reason, and one of those reasons is to see lives changed as they accept the kingship of Christ over their life, right? And I say this often too, but he didn't say, go ye therefore and make converts. He said, go ye therefore and make disciples. And there's a really big difference between a convert and a disciple. A disciple is somebody who's continually staying hungry and wanting to be more like Christ every day. That's our definition of it. So aiming higher, that's for all of us. Aiming higher means, was there anything I did today that was not like Christ, but am I doing better today than I was yesterday on my mission of being more like him? That's submitting to the king. And we don't really get that so much, but if you lived in the days when kings, when, you know, as in the days of the Bible, the king had the authority to kill you with no reason. No trial, no nothing. They could just take you out if they wanted to. And, and China's doing that right now, too. They actually came up with a new word. They called the person was disappeared. Well-known people disappeared. So today, it's the authority of God's spoken word. Can you say that with me, please? The authority of God's spoken word. The authority of God's spoken word. So something about the spirit of God in us and the word of God in us that as we speak I'm going to say, yes, the Bible, of course, quote scripture, but God's word to Manny came in about five different ways, didn't it? Were you catching what, what he was saying? Like, he shows up, somebody just says something random. The guy from prison says something random. Wasn't random, right? It was that verse from Joshua, and then he goes somewhere else, and somebody says it, and it's like, oh my God, like, you're talking to me. You're real. You're out there. You're confirming yourself to me in what doesn't look like a big deal. But it is a big deal because the people that are saying it don't know the chain reaction it's causing. I was in New York City, and there was a guy in a, a, a men's Bible study who was a very successful Wall Street guy, made a lot of money. He was in his 30s, probably in his mid-30s, and he was a great salesman. He was very charming. He came from London. He had this great accent. He had the whole package together, and he wasn't saved. And didn't think he needed to be saved because he was living a life. He was making a lot of money. He could date whoever he wanted to. And yet, he, he had a neighbor on his, in, in his apartment that was a Christian. I kept inviting him to a Bible study. And he's like, oh, you wouldn't want me in that Bible study. I'm a sinner. I know about you people. But they just kept loving up on him. And loving up. And then one after another, these little clues like what Manny was talking about today happened. And he was about to have an affair with a woman in a hotel. And... He, he ordered the uh, champagne from downstairs, and the guy that brought up the champagne hands him the bottle and says, God bless you. <laughs> now, that doesn't sound like much, does it? He said, what did you just say? <laughs> and the guy that works at the hotel said, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I said, you know, I said something about blessing people. And, and it was no. It was like the exact thing the guy needed at the exact right time. You don't have to be a preacher in a pulpit to impact people if you give a word of the Lord at the right time. See, that's also the Bible. Yes, the Bible, true, is the word. But all those people that were speaking out to Manny as part of this one plant, another waters, come on, 
God gives the increase, right? So what are we doing with the spoken words of our mouth? That's, that's the theme today. And then I said fearlessly proclaim the gospel because I love that expression. Paul uses it twice in Ephesians chapter 6. And you also know that the armor of God, hopefully if you've been around a while, you know that's a chapter, Ephesians 6, where we list the armor of God. And the sword of the spirit is, yeah, you all went to Sunday school, you know that one, right? So we'll get there. But today we're going to talk more about the sword of the spirit. And as the weeks go by, we can talk as the Lord is leading us about other parts of the armor. So in Ephesians 6.13, it says, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Is this an evil day? <laughs> I'll start with easy questions. <laughs> That's pretty easy to figure out, isn't it? And the, verse 17 says, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word, and, and the word for word there is rhema. And Manny said that too. Right? I don't know if you caught that while he was praying or before he went back down to his seat. Which is, anybody heard what rhema means? Anybody here? There's a college out in Oklahoma that Kenneth Hagin found it called rhema. Right? And revelation is the common understanding of it. But it's, there's more to it, see, because rhema often refers to the spoken words of God. Whether it be through Jesus, the prophets, the apostles, I'll say, or Manny. Or that guy in the hotel, right? It's a word of God in season. It's, it's God's word spoken through his people, which is why I've said it ties into the prophetic conference that we're doing. Because you might not be called to be a prophet in title, but you are called to be prophetic. The world would call that intuition. They would call it, I had a hunch. I had a sense about something. It's also called discernment. Holy Spirit will increase your discernment. Okay, do you believe that? Yeah, but, and why wouldn't we want more of that? Of course we would. And, you, you know, we've had, we have a big audience on, on Facebook, so people will see our post and say, where's that in the Bible, school of the prophets? You know, they're, they're trying to tear us down. It's like, well, it's right in there. Elijah and Elisha, they, you know, it's all there. Just read your book, read the Bible. But, you know, we want to be kind to them, but we also, you know, some of them don't want, want to believe it's true, I'm, I'm sorry to say. So anyway. The point is, we're not saying that you have to be every one of the fivefold gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Every one of us here, it's a beautiful thing. We look differently, and we're all individually different. And there's nobody that's ever going to be just like you again. But anybody who's in this world would benefit from hearing the voice of God more clearly. Every single one of us, doesn't matter who we are, there's not a person alive who wouldn't benefit more than whatever, whatever good things they have going on now. Things would be better if Jesus was their Lord. That's, that's just true. He created the whole universe. Why wouldn't we want him in our lives? Well, look at how the devil has attacked Holy Spirit in the course of the years that the Protestant church has been around. And it took this Blind, one blind-eye guy in Los Angeles, right, William Seymour, the Pentecostal movement had, had other sparks going on at the time. But when the Pentecostal church really started to grow, the world changed. The church has grown more through the Pentecostal charismatic movement than anything else ever. There's more Christians alive today than ever. But you would think in America, you're not seeing so much of it. There's plenty out there. But in the countries that are, that are more second and third tier, that don't have all the wealth that we have, it's booming, including in China. Because it's true. And because they're many times much more in tune with the spirit world than the Americans are. <laughs> I'm trying not to go off the tangent here. You have the Spirit of God inside. You have a furnace because the Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that there's a fire in the Holy of Holies. There's a fire. So that fire inside of you is burning whether you know it or not. You can fan the flame. You can, you can increase that fire or you can let it dwindle down. But you are the temple now. And you want to keep sharpening all of these skills, not because you want a great name in the church, this is the great name in the church, servant. But, but the currency of the kingdom is lives that are changing. So how many lives change because you brought the kingdom to people? It's unlimited amount. I mean, people telling us they're watching from Australia and New Zealand and like all over the world. 
Like, you don't know who you're touching. You're never going to know it all. But I want to ha- hear him say, well done. Right? That's a good thing to aspire to, not to strive. Because striving implies, I'm working, working, working for you, Jesus. How come I'm not getting my answer prayer? That's not how this works. There's, there's a war going on between evil and good. And that's this chapter, really, is spiritual warfare. So take up the armor. Take up the tools that I've given you. Be aware. Be discerning about what the power of your words is, good and bad. Death is also in there too, isn't it? I don't want death in my mouth. I want life coming out of my mouth. That doesn't mean we're not firm with people when we have to be firm. That could be the greatest loving thing you could do for them is to be firm. Tell them not to do something because it's sin. Now, you could say that in a harsh way, but let there be life in what you're saying. All right, I think you get it. And then it says the prophets, the apostles, or the, the, us, the, the, the disciples, the people who are trying to get beyond a convert and into a disciple of Christ, we can carry that same power in our words without negating the power of the truth of the Bible. Because that's another whole thing is like, well, prophets are not longer anymore for today because as soon as they prophesy, they're trying to add to the Bible. And in the book of Revelation, it says anyone who adds to this book. Now, really, that is such a, a, a reductionist way to think about all this because Philip is, is in, in the book of Acts, Philip's there and God says, I want you to go down to the road, okay? What would we have said? Why? <laughs> right? Well, we would have said, why? I, I don't have time for this right now. If, if I agree it's a good idea, maybe I'll go. No, no, he just went. And then he said, I want you to go over to the guy in the chariot over there. Why? I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> and it wasn't until he went over to there that the guy said, I'm reading this book here called the Bible, the book of Isaiah. Can you help me? And Philip probably went, thanks. Now I know why. And man, amazing. Got the guy baptized right there. Amazing, right? He was the right man at the right time who had his ears open, wasn't trying to know all the steps. He just needed to know the next step. That's discernment. <laughs> personal nature of God's revelation. The personal nature of God's revelation is so powerful. How could it be that the church would be as big as, as it is today if people weren't hearing from the Lord? You have to know his will. We're all different. So yes, the, the word of the Bible is there to show us the truth of the word and to memorize scriptures and, and make that part of the ethical construct of our lives is we know thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, all the things that we know, but then how do I apply it in the particular person that's me? It's not going to always be exactly the same. Yes, the truths are always going to be the same. Sex is confined to two people who make a covenant relationship on an altar, not a stage, not a platform, not the, the justice of the peace. Okay, like that's just one example that the world doesn't understand the spiritual nature of intimacy sexually between two people. High sacred thing. And God's saying, aim higher. Aim higher. Well, I'm just looking at pornography. What's the big deal? That's a sin. It's listed right in the book as a sin. But it's not just that. It's draining people of the energy that is meant to be devoted to their spouse. Only. Only. Oh, it gets quiet when you talk about that one, doesn't it? Ephesians 6, 18. Be alert. Say it. Alert. I'm alert. Yeah, that's good. That's how he wants all of us to be all the time. Be alert. There could be an opportunity coming that you're not expecting. There was a man, the first guy that ever won a million dollars on who wants to be a millionaire. You know how they have those extra gifts that you get, like all those, those cheats that you get? And, and, and Regis is all pumped up. It's the last question. You've got a half a million. You could be the first guy. Do you, what do you want to do? Do you want to just take the money and go? He says, I want to phone a friend. That was a good answer, right? So, okay. Makes the call. Who do you want to call? My father. Gets the guy on the phone. It's your son. He's got a chance to be the next millionaire. And, uh, okay, go. And the clock starts ticking, and you only get whatever it is, 30 seconds. And um, the guy says... Hey, Dad, how you doing? <laughs> like, the last thing you'd expect him to say. And, and Regis is looking at him like, well, aren't you going to you know, ask for help? He says, um, I felt like calling you because I want to tell you I just won a million dollars. <laughs> but he hadn't answered the question yet. <laughs> All right? That's alert. And Regis is like, 
really? Like, what if you're wrong? You're going to look like a fool. He's like, oh, no, I know. Richard Nixon, final answer, bing, 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 million dollars. See, that's how we're supposed to live. Just present to the moment, every moment. There's always going to be another way you could handle a situation than just blurting the first thing out that comes to your mind. The devil is really good at doing that. But being alert prevents that from happening. We have discernment. We're aware of things. We don't have to rush into big decisions. That's the worst thing you can do half the time and how we get manipulated often. And then he said, pray also for me whenever I speak that words, that word there is logos, right? So that's the truth of a word, but different from rhema, may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Boy, that's a convicting word, isn't it? I will fearlessly build the currency of the kingdom because change lies as the currency of the kingdom. And when I speak this, I'm not going to let fear stop me from doing what I know God told me to do. But boy, there's a lot of nuance in what God tells you how to do that, isn't there? And especially if you're in a secular job, you've got to not only know the fluency of your world with the kingdom of God, you've got to be able to interpret how to use what you know spiritually into this secular setting when they're running off a completely different set of rules, like that guy in that hotel room. He'd be the one that everybody would look up to as the hero and making a lot of money and is a good salesman, drives a beautiful car. Forget about the sexual activity, but that would be looked up to in the world. Brutal. He says, I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. And then in Revelation 1, talking about the Lord, it says, in his right hand, just Jesus, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came what? A sharp, two-edged, little louder. Right. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Not just the written Word, but the spoken Word. The sword of the Spirit, which is the spoken Word of God, as well as, not in place of, but as well as the written Word. And I got some people giving me a funny look right now. That's always good. Revelation 2, next chapter. These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Verse 16, therefore repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. <laughs> That's the Lord talking. Now, we know that in Hebrews it says the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? So that would make sense that we would talk about that today, and I will. But I just want to give you a picture before we get there of how, how I try to look at this, because I do work... I used to work a lot more in a very secular setting and had to put all these things into practice that I'm talking to you about. So the, the example he gave me was, say, say you own a business and you have two warehouses, warehouse one on the left, warehouse two on the right. But instead of the warehouse idea in, in the natural, think of it as you have a bank account over here in your heart and a bank account over here in your heart. There's two different storehouses that you can pull from when you need to. And in the middle of that, there's somebody called a dispatcher. Anybody work for a company that had a dispatcher? Key. It's a key role. But you have a dispatcher, too, because you've got a gate on your mouth. And something decides when something should come out and when it shouldn't, but not just what comes out, how it should come out, and what you should say. Hmm. That's a big role, being a dispatcher. Because death and life is in the power of your Spoken words. Trisha can speak words with a look. You don't even need to know what the words are because she's making her point really good. I'm not looking at her right now, but I will. I love you. Now, in Romans, we hear this language that says, according to the flesh. Those who live according. Did you ever think about this? The word accord. Your flesh is in accord with sin, when you're living according to the flesh. But if you're living according to the Spirit, you're in accord with a whole different set of rules, whole different reality frame that God would want us to have. So that's according to the Spirit. So one warehouse wants a ready, fire, aim. My flesh, my reaction, I lose my temper, boom, nasty stuff comes out of my mouth. The other side is ready, pray. Yeah? Everything. At all times, pray. Before you open it, pray. 
I know what I want to say, Lord, but what do you want to say? Well, and the guy's waiting for an answer. So what? So what? Just say, pretend you're from Tennessee. No, but really, we forget how fast people talk up here. What's the rush? You say something wrong, you can't get it back. Be discerning. Be discerning. Don't just blurt it out. So this is it in, in Romans. It says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And I'm saying the death words are coming out from one warehouse, and the life words are coming out of the other warehouse, death and life. And then you have this choice. Every minute of every day, there's a dispatcher in your heart that's deciding what gets out, released into the atmosphere. It's a gate. That's a gatekeeper of what comes out. How about worship? How great is worship? Like, you already know what's coming out is lining up with the word as long as you trust whatever the lyrics are that we're singing. Right? Not me and Mrs. Jones. We got a thing going on. That's not good. That's the wrong gate. <laughs> Lose that key. <laughs> uh -uh. Hebrews 12, this is what I said. And, and it just, you know, bear with me for a minute here because the word is rhema. For the spoken word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Anybody walking out, you think I'm a heretic for saying this? The word of God, the Bible, that's how most of us would just look at this, of course, it's alive. The book is breathing. It's speaking to you. It's always, you're always seeing something new in there. But what about this part? And what about when Manny was, that guy that just had gotten out of prison said, Joshua, whatever. Oh, I don't remember the verse, but quoted the verse from Joshua. Like, like, I'm checking all these boxes in my brain. I'm talking about that today. It's the very thing I'm talking about. That was a word from the Lord. Even though that guy, like the one in the hotel, just said, God bless you. Didn't even know it was a word from the Lord. But how easy would it have been to just blow that off? And that guy is standing in, this whole, in, our, in our Bible study, a Christian, because somebody said, God bless you. See, one plant, another waters, God gives the increase. We don't have to worry. Some people will say, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking of bringing a friend to King of Kings, but I'll probably get there around 11. Because the worship's a little, it's a little much. Flags, shofars blowing. I don't think they're going to like it. And, and we've had people that came in that you would think would be the last one that would like it come to us after and said, I've been waiting for this for a really long time. You know, it's just so, don't try to outthink God because you can't. It's not going to work. And we're not going to stop waving flags and blowing chauffeurs either. <laughs> Too much to be happy about. So the spoken word, the rhema of God, is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, I'm just going to say, anytime you talk about the word in James, it says, be careful about being a teacher because you're going to be held up to a higher standard. And sometimes you're tempted to make it say something that you want it to say, but it really doesn't say. Okay, so don't do that either. Because God really cares about the people in the pews. That, 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 who's ever up here is not confusing them. So I'm just asking you to think about this verse that you might have for so long. Yes, of course it's true that the word that we read convicts us, doesn't it? Right down to the, to the who we are part of our heart. And it opens us up and says, oh, no, that was wrong what I did. i got to go apologize to that person. I, I might not have meant it, but now that I'm reflecting back on it, I shouldn't have said that. That's what this means, I believe, piercing to the joints and marrow. But it could also be somebody who's not saved. They hear the word, and it pierces them, and they go, oh, I need a Savior. Pray for me. I'm done. I'm done running, running away from God. I want to run towards God. Right? You think there's a few of them in New Jersey? Please say yes. <laughs> and here's an example. Mark 14, 72. Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Jesus said that. Jesus is the word. So the rhema was, yeah, Peter, I know you think you're going to die. But no, before the rooster crows twice, in Mark it says this, you'll have denied me three times. No, I'll never deny you. 
Can you relate as a human being? The things that we want to do, we don't always get done. And then it says, when he thought about this, he wept. That's what it does. That's what this piercing does. It brings conviction in our heart. Like, I thought I knew who I was, but I really didn't. There's more layers of me under there than I realized. I'm not quite the hero I thought I was. That's not bad news. That's good news if you do something about it. That's why the word coming out of your mouth matters. Right, get it from the right warehouse. The life warehouse, not the death warehouse. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Who's the angel talking to? Louder. All right, thank you. You know Mary was Jewish, right? Some people don't want to hear that one, man. Mary? She's Catholic. She can't be Jewish. <laughs> right? Help us. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you, this Luke chapter 1, man, it's so powerful, right? Like, she, she didn't have any of the credentials that the world would, would look up to as someone who would still be talked about for good reason, right? She's an amazing person. I'm not saying pray to her, but let's not discount what she did. And she was willing to put her life on the line, right? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. This is Gabriel speaking to her, a word of God, See, the word, the rhema, the spoken word is coming to her. And she says, and then he says, for with God, nothing will be impossible. And the way it's done in Greek is no thing. The thing there is rhema, meaning no word spoken by God is impossible because nothing is impossible for God. Now, right now, this could get into, well, how do I know it's God speaking? What if it's a false prophet? That's why you need discernment. That's why you need to be in a house that's teaching you how to do this and trying to develop your gifts. And nobody does it perfectly, but if, if we're trying, if we're men and women that are after God's heart in everything we do, it'll make you a better parent, a better employee, a better boss, a better everything you do. Because you'll recognize, right, like humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. You're, you're not the big door prize you thought you were. There's still something else he can show you. And it's, it's the humble people that have the most impact. You know, because you can mix those two warehouses up pretty bad. You could be walking under the anointing and shift from one, hair, one warehouse to the other. Yeah, and that's why the gifts of God are without repentance, Right? So the person that still has the gift but shifts to the wrong warehouse looks like they're under the anointing, but now they're using that anointing for their own good. And that causes wreckage. When a man or a woman of God goes off into the wrong direction, just a trail of tears behind that. So when they say pray for your pastors, they're not kidding. Because if you're going to sit in that seat and listen, you better be hoping that me and Trisha are listening too. Or else you're going to get something that's from the wrong warehouse. <laughs> but look at this. Because in verse 18 it says, Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, which we called unction when I was growing up as a Christian. I don't know about you. You know what that word means? Unction? Anybody? Okay. Like an anointing. I felt the unction on that word. And that's what she's doing. Like, it's spectacular news, but very hard to grasp for a teenage girl to think that God is going to impregnate her. This is not your normal day that you just go through. Like, God just shows up in the form of Gabriel and says, I'm going to be the mother of God in the earth. Like, I need a little time to process that one. But she did it. It says, behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your rhema. That's the word, according to your word, according to the revelation that you brought from heaven. And I'm just trying to say, let's not make this harder than it has to be. He's a good father, right? If your father was teaching you how to ride the bike, he's not yelling at you when you fall, hopefully. <laughs> if you are, come up for prayer. If you're one of those people, <laughs> it's probably a root in there somewhere, right? Like, no, a good father... Kid, you'll pick the kid up and you'll get him back and try it this way, try it that way. That's what God does. He wants to see that we're 
that we're men and women after his heart, that we want to know the heart of God, and just that we're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, that person will be filled. But that fire will also be burning brighter as well. You know, recent men's ministry, that's one of the things. Of, how do I keep from plateauing? How do I stay excited about reading the word? Well, keep coming to these men's studies. That will help. Do what David said. Get four other, five other people that you're going to be willing to be accountable to and hold each other accountable. And, and what's going on in your life? That's so powerful to have that in the body of Christ. So I'm going to just remind you that it said in James chapter 3, 1. I'm sorry, chapter, yeah, I think it is 3, 1. That's a, mis, that's a typo. Teachers are to be held to the strictest standards, right? So we're not taking this lightly when we're up here with a microphone in our hands or anybody that we bring in here. We're not taking this lightly that, that you can let your guard down and receive what they're telling you, like what Manny said about Robert Henderson, that, that it's going to have life in it. But I'll leave it at that. I'm going to cut ahead a little bit because of the time. Um, when, when Peter and John were in Samaria, they were the Jewish lead figures in Jerusalem, and Philip got, went down to Samaria, and a revival broke out, so then the leaders in Jerusalem send Peter and John to check it out, okay? Now, this is, this is pertinent for today, because a word of the Lord would be, all people are created equally, and all should be treated with equal dignity as a priceless treasure. <laughs> but then we look at our own lives, and do we treat people as a priceless treasure? Not always. Why? Because they didn't deserve it. They got me annoyed. When they behave the way I want to, then I'll be nice. <laughs> Wrong answer. But see how hard this is. This is what Jesus is asking us to do. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. That's why you need to pray. And, and often it's the ones that are like the most prickly that need the Lord the most. And, and when you're not reacting the way they expect you to, it's like, oh, this person's different. So they go down there, and they're not, they're not even aware that Gentiles could come in the kingdom in any kind of major way. So there's a built-in bias from that religious spirit that they grew up with. But now the Messiah comes, and he's talking to a woman at the well, whether she's a Samaritan, right? Mary Magdalene, out of whom seven demons had been cast out. She's the first one to see the risen Christ, Right? Peter says, I perceive you're no respecter of person, meaning like you don't value one person over another. You can use anybody. If they can fog up a mirror, you can use them. <laughs> Peter, I'll go back one. This man that was there, Peter and John, placed their hands on them, on the Samaritans, and, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon, one of the locals in Samaria, saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that anyone on whom I lay my hands might receive the Holy Spirit. Well, like the love of money is the root of all evil. Right? You see it everywhere. And they said, Peter said, uh-uh, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God. Is that God speaking through him? You bet. That's a word of the Lord. That's a rhema coming out of his mouth. He, you know, he doesn't want to say, I want nothing to do with you. He's helping this man realign his thinking to understand that might have worked on the old pattern. This is a new pattern now. You got to follow God. You got to submit to him and obey to him. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. That's a rainbow word. That's not being cruel to somebody. That's helping them know you've been living your whole life as a warehouse in the world. And you're doing good based on that set of rules, but you can have the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and a big church of people that love God to show you a better way. That's what this is about. Nobody's got all the answers. Nobody's perfect. I'm going to skip ahead to the last group here. Thank you, Dave. That's, that's kind of a requirement in every service. <laughs> the word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. We all know this from Romans chapter 10, right? 10, 9, and 10. It's part of the Romans road. The word is in your mouth and in your heart. The word, his word, in here with the spirit of God. 
That is the good news that we've been called to preach to you. So if you believe deep in your heart that God raised Jesus from the pit of death, and if, you're, if you voice your allegiance that you believe it, by confessing the truth, Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved. It's a good verse, isn't it? I heard that one before I was a Christian. That got me. You don't just think the thought. You say it out loud. I believe. Say it with me, would you? I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life believing that at a deeper level. Belief begins in the heart and leads to life that's right with God. Confession comes out, departs from our lips, and brings eternal salvation. I'm ending here in 1 Peter chapter 1. When we told you, remember this is Peter talking, who's a fisherman, not the, you know, not the highest cultured guy, but man, God loved him, didn't he? When we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, the anointed, we were relying on what our eyes had seen of his glorious majesty, not cleverly told fables. So this is the power of your testimony, okay? Like you know for sure that God made himself real to you. And sometimes the people that are not Christians that you're witnessing to, they'll say, well, that has never happened to me. So you don't want to make it just about your testimony. But when you give your testimony, no one can argue with you about that. It's what happened to you. It's your, it's your experience that God made himself real. So it won't be the same testimony, but God will make himself real to you too. If you're hungry, he'll meet you where you are. Isn't that awesome? We weren't making this stuff up. And then he says, God the Father lavished honor and glory upon Jesus when the voice of the majestic glory echoed from heaven. This is my beloved son, and my favor rests on him. But now you are a Christian, and you are beloved sons and daughters, and God's favor wants to rest on you. You just have to yield to it and be willing to be a disciple and say, I'm Getting in as salvation got me in, but now I want to go higher. I'm going to keep on aiming higher in everything I do, including the gate. <laughs> Rhema, we witnessed this. We ourselves heard the voice. This is Peter, right? Okay. I heard the voice. Okay. I'm not crazy. We all heard it. Well, him and John were there. It's the Mount of Transfiguration. We heard the voice. So you're never going to take that away from him. We heard the voice. Jesus on the holy mountain. We now have a fuller confirmation of the message of the prophets because we heard it. You would do well to pay close attention to these words, wouldn't you? And another portion of scripture says, yeah, that's great. Blessed are those who see, but blessed are the ones who still believe even though they haven't seen me. Right? And that, I don't know, maybe you have, but most Christians would say they haven't, but they still believe. Amen? Can we stand? That word that he says, you would do well to play, co pay close attention to this word. It's like a light that shines in the darkness of night until the day dawns when the morning star rises in your heart. Now, I'll just give you again, Matt Herbie say it, but when the prophets come here for the school of the prophets, the verse that popped out at me was from Job where it says, there is hope for a tree, even though it's cut down to the stump, at the scent of water, it springs back to life. That's what the prophetic can be for us. That's what it was in that hotel room. All the guy said was, God bless you, but there was life in it. There was rainbow on it for that particular guy. So when we're asking about why would I go to a school of the prophets, it's because I want to learn from people who operate in this, who've written books about it, who love us as a church, who are going to keep coming back here because they understand that we know how important this is. But more important than that, when we've, when we've achieved a certain level at somebody, uh, at something in the kingdom, why wouldn't we want to help other people get there? We would, right? We hold conferences on worship because we've achieved some certain level of it, and, and whatever it can add value, that's a kingdom thing to do. Not like, well, we don't want them to know how to lead worship because they'll compete against us. Just shoot me on that one. Really? It's the kingdom. All right. But notice first that no prophecy found in Scripture is a matter of the prophet's own interpretation. Anybody have read this, voice, uh, this verse before? Right, this is important, right? It's got to be from God. It can't be from a Saulish part of our nature. It's got to be the Spirit of God speaking to us. And it's really easy 
to go back into that wrong warehouse to make yourself look good. Anybody ever get pushed down on a prayer line? I rest my case. God needs my help. I'm going to look bad if you don't fall down. Thank you, Nate. Prophecy, I promise you, if you ever get pushed down here, come up and tell me, and we'll talk about it. Prophecy has never been a product of human initiative, but it comes when men and women, any, any men and women here, I'll wait. <laughs> It's kind of a charged thing to ask in 2023. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, we're here. Come up for prayer. Men and women are moved to speak on behalf of God by the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I just speak this over each one of us here today. Rhema coming out of our mouth, the word of God coming out of our mouth, life and death in the power of our tongue, that we will recognize the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, both the written word that we read and the spoken word that comes out of our mouth. We want to be people that cause this region to be turned upside down from status quo has to go to the kingdom of God being the reigning and ruling authority in this region. And you use us because you choose to cooperate with us. And we count that a great privilege, Lord. So we say, have your way in the Somerset Hills. Have your way in New York City on Times Square. And in this whole region, wherever sin is abounding, let the grace of God abound even greater. And thank you for being willing to use flawed people that, that might not be perfect, but are willing to be used, be men and women after your own heart. In Jesus' name. I can't end without offering to pray for somebody that doesn't know the Lord, okay? You might have come here today because a friend asked you to come. You've never accepted the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior. We quoted that verse from Romans chapter 10. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Okay, and all the people here that are Christians all said that prayer one way or another at, the, at, at a time in their life where they probably wouldn't be here. So that might be you, and we don't want you to leave until you say this prayer if the Lord is so moving you to do so. So we'll just pray it out loud together. Anybody who's watching at home, say it with us, okay? Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the gift that you gave me in his life, his death and his resurrection, and, the, and sending Holy Spirit to fill me. I ask you to forgive me of the things that have separated me from you. That could be a lot of things, so you just think about that for a minute. I don't want to be separated from you anymore. I want to come into your courts as a son and a daughter. Forgive me, Lord. I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to understand who you created me to be so that I can fulfill the destiny that you have for my life. Thank you for welcoming me into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. That's a good prayer. Be welcomed into the family of God. Spirit of adoption, fall on your people, Lord, in Jesus' name. So we have a prayer ministry team that comes up at the end of all our services. If you're needing prayer, come up that aisle. If you said that prayer today for the first time and you received the Lord, we highly encourage you to come up. Ask your friend to bring you up here. We'll give you a Bible. We'll get you started. Otherwise, church, have an awesome day. Hopefully you can make it over to fellowship.